or could. <laughs> Can you hear me okay over the computer or, or uh, over the uh, phone? Audio. They're listening to you over my phone, Alex. Right, uh, look, I can't get this PowerPoint. I've got the PowerPoint presentation looking, but it, it won't share. So I'm just um, trying to work out a way of doing it. Um, well, maybe, Alex, the best thing to do maybe would just be to do a, a talk through and a bit of a discussion about what it is that you do, just for those people that yeah. are listening. Uh, maybe we can share the presentation with them online afterwards. We'll convert it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then we'll, we'll, we can go through it by the. We can do. We, I can do a talk through, and then we'll. Uh, if you've got any questions in the meantime, feel free to. Um, feel free to ask. Um, look, basically, uh, can everybody hear okay? Yes. Yeah. There's going to be a barrel of laughs with all these photographs that I'm referring to. But anyway, we'll talk about uh, talk about wild prey. Basically, wild prey. Wildlife and Animal Damage Control Company, or Animal, animal Damage. I can't hear him now. I don't know if anyone else can. Neither can I. Emma, don't mute yourself. Sorry, Alex, I was just muting everyone because there was a dog barking and I muted myself as well. Okay, it, was, it gave me a bit of a dry run anyway. Go ahead, Alex. My apologies. Yeah. Let me just, I'll just turn this thing off for a second. I'll try to get this thing to share. Just give me a second. Yeah, look, basically, Wildpro was set up in, in, in 1995 as a, uh, to, to deal with sensitive uh, issues regarding overabundant wildlife, uh, introduced, and the management of introduced predators. Um, across the broad, broad spectrum of pest control, effectively. Uh, our specialist services include you know, conducting investigations, uh, looking into sightings of animals that people have seen, you know, the, the ubiquitous uh, mountain lion and puma that's seen throughout the eastern seaboard of Australia, investigating suspicious and unusual deaths and circumstances, uh, you know, assisting in the carrying out of post-mortem examinations of Things that have died uh, in unusual circumstances, uh, using conservation dogs uh, from the outset, pretty well. I'm primarily a, a professional hunter. Our organisation has 11 full time staff and a number of casuals, all with various degrees of skill across the um, broad spectrum of um, animal damage control. Uh, we've got people that, are, that have got very good skills in uh, training and managing dogs. Uh, most of our staff have got either a police or a military background. Um, a couple of the boys have been um, overseas uh, in the, serving in the military with uh, IED and drug dogs, and also bite dogs. So they're, they're pretty well up to speed with all the current training, training techniques or most effective training techniques assessment techniques and they're also very good dog handlers. Um, my background as a professional hunter basically has been always using dogs across you know, all the all the areas that we operate in as far as hunting is concerned. Um, mainly it's been regarding introduced species such as um, feral cats, wild dogs, foxes, and, and the other non-predatory animals such as deer, feral pigs, uh, goats, and exotic animals, a lot of things like uh, you know, anacondas introduced, um, pests such as uh, red-eared slider turtles, various other critters that people choose to bring into the country. We've done work for uh, both state and federal agencies in the location and management of those. So we, we've got recording and reporting facilities, monitoring facilities, photography and video facilities, um, night vision, thermal imagery, uh, and the context often is with regards to damage assessments, disease control, 
identification of species. We do scat analysis, stomach content analysis, high risk recovery of animals, high risk rescue, blood tracking, which is you know animals that have been injured or that have wandered off after being hit by vehicles or been wounded in various various ways. We can locate them. Dead animal um, recovery and removal, disposal, biological hazards, um, live capture of animals using the various trapping te techniques, including leg hold traps. We have the ministerial approval to use leg holds in build up areas, which is fairly unusual. And we've also got the specialist um, weapon systems that we use, including tranquilizer gear, category A, B, and C firearms. Uh, suppressors, which just effectively silences. We, we're commercial wildlife controllers, licensed pest control, licensed pest control operators, licensed vermin control operators. And as I said before, we've got commercial approval to um, use leg holds in build-up areas. We use dogs extensively in um, in urban and in rural jobs to make us more effective operationally. In effect. Um, we across the board broad spectrum of equipment that's available to us, even though we have all this whiz bang equipment, all this fantastic computer technology that's not working for us at the moment. Um, it's very hard to beat the you know, nose dogs to do the work that we do, and also to speed things up. And being a commercial uh, organisation, uh, the quickly and more efficiently we get things done, the better it is for everybody involved, and it also uh, reflects on our professionalism. Uh, with some of the work that we've um, done in recent times has been uh, the management of uh, predators in uh, the Alpine resort areas, uh, in protection of uh, Baramus parvus, the Alpine, uh, the mountain pygmy possum. And the dogs have been absolutely fantastic in, in identifying uh, the locations of, uh, especially, think, especially cats in boulder fields, and under heath, in and around uh, resort buildings, around the ski lifts, without the dogs, really, it's almost impossible to see them. Even using some of this wrist band gear, the terrain doesn't really lend itself to being able to, um, to have a high high hit rate as far as uh, the location of these critters is concerned. And also, uh, we use the dogs for recovery of, of uh, feral animals that have been shot. So most of this work is done after dark. And um, where, where, where the cats and foxes and wild dogs have been shot in areas where you can't safely send somebody to, to recover the, the animal, the dogs have been very effective in locating and recovering large forests. Alex, um, can I ask yes. a question? Um, just in relation Please. to the cat stuff you said you were doing, are you using the dogs to sort of bail, um, bail the cats into a location? Look, we, we, that, that, that is part of it, but basically the dogs are actually, um, I'll give you a little bit of a context. A lot of the stuff that I, my, my training in, um, or my training and experience in, in, in finding cats pretty well started in the US, where we did a lot of work on mountain lions and bobcats and lynx, etc. And uh, the dogs that we're using are, are bred down from the dogs that are used over there for that purpose. So. As far as dogs are concerned, cats, doesn't matter really what size they are, pretty well smell all the same and have similar characteristics as far as odour is concerned. So we can identify cats um, that are in, that are you know, holed up in, in, say, dens or in areas that they normally frequent, you know, under buildings, um, in, you know, in a den site, in a boulder field where you probably wouldn't be able to see them under normal circumstances, you know, in, say, broad daylight. Um, you know, so it's more it's point. more about detecting the cat rather than sort of chasing and, and holding the cat in a location. Well, it's all, it's it's about both. Oh, it's so, it is both. Know, we can we can find we can find uh, where the cats have been and identify their, their um, areas where they where they've left scats and sprays. We can also identify uh, areas where the, where the cats have recently moved. Um, and at the same time, while we're out there, uh, the dogs if the dogs put up a cat and find a cat, we can. We can engage that cat fairly pretty well straight away. Are you there? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we can, we can at, at the risk of sounding incredible, we can kill them um, at the same But basically, value adds to the job. So we can not only can we find the scats and the locations and sites where these animals are living, we can also uh, deal with the cats 
as we as they become targets of opportunity, yeah. which uh, which which is fairly attractive to a lot of the land managers. Um, the dogs, the dogs, um, you know, th there are dogs that we've got that'll that'll pursue cats and bail them. Yeah, both usually in trees or in areas where they where the dogs can't reach them. Um, we have to be sensitive to a number of the issues that arise there. We don't we don't we don't want the dogs grabbing grabbing the cats. And, but we also we don't, we also like the dogs to be able to indicate where they are. Um, most of the dogs we use for this sort of work are whack dogs, wild animal control dogs, which make it fairly obvious um, that uh, they've identified the presence of a cat and uh, due to the very high prey drive, they'll um, they'll pursue the cat until it pulls up. Mm -hmm. you know, be that be that down a down a hole or up a tree or you know in an area where it can't be reached. And I, I just asked the question, there was a good study done in uh, Western Australia um, comparing leg hold traps and dogs for yeah. um, safely finding cats and, and euthanising them and they found that the dogs actually caused less injury. Yeah, look, the thing is... But that was for bailing rather not, than... Yeah, look, there's not one thing of itself that is the, the, you know, the panacea or the one-shot killer punch that's going to knock them all over. Um, <laughs> there's definitely room for leg hole traps to be used in the trapping of cats. At this stage in Victoria, it's not legal to use them to target cats. They do, they, we do get them as a bycatch when we're trapping foxes uh, fairly regularly. But we use soft cats leg hole traps, which um, which don't uh, really injure the cats. And they, you know, we, we usually, if the cats are feral cats in say build up areas, we scan them for microchips. If they've got a microchip, we deliver them to the council. Um, and the, the, the ones that, um, that don't have microchips and they're obviously exhibiting um, the feral cat behaviour are euthanized um, usually on, on the scene. The, the cats, the cats that are out in the, in the, in, the, in our operation areas, away from metropolitan areas, we we deal with them pretty well straight away. We've never come across anything that's at a market dipping it out in the bush. But uh, using leg hole traps, um, and I was going to cover this in my presentation. Uh, using leg hole traps, uh, shooting um, night vision equipment. And, and using conservation dogs as, a, as an integrated control uh, management tool is, is, is the way to go. Uh, without the dogs, uh, things become very, very slow, and especially if we have got you know, cats that are fairly clever, smart cats, they don't want to go to trap sites and they actively avoid um, humans. Um, they're the hardest ones to get. They're the ones that the dogs uh, 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 invaluable in, in locating and dealing with. Yeah. So it's, it's like with anything, it's that combination of tools to find the last one. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, there's got to be, there's got to be, you've got to pretty well have the whole kit, but the dogs form a, a, a significant role in, in what we do with them. Uh, they, without them, it, it, it lost, it lost much, much harder. Take, things take longer. Um, we, we, you know, when you when you actually got conservation dogs or whack dogs, but what we're specialising in, um, you can operate throughout the entire day and at night. We're um, using a lot of the other techniques. You're respected by you know you can be restricted by weather, especially up in the alpine regions. You know where you get cloud coming in. When you've got heavy cloud coming, in, you can't safely shoot animals um, due to not being able to identify you know the presence of humans. You'd be surprised where human beings turn up. <laughs> in the middle of the bush, especially uh, especially in some of these alpine resorts uh, at night, we've got some funny arms. You know, it's, it's you get to see with animal like vision getting. But the, 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 we use the dogs both um, after dark and, and during daylight hours for, for that work, and uh, it's, it's very effective. We, we use uh, tracking, tracking systems, uh, you know, usually the Gamma Alpha 100 systems with the T5 collars. To, um, to be able to uh, identify exactly where the dogs have been, what areas they've covered, what areas they haven't covered, areas that we want them to concentrate on. And we can fairly quickly identify areas that we may have missed. And we can also monitor exactly what the dog's doing at any given time. Anybody feel, feel free to chime in with any questions you've got. Uh, well, well yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask a question again since... Um, people are still being quiet. Um, you mentioned that you are working the dogs at night. I don't think there's a lot of us that do. 
What's the difference with working dogs between night and day? Is there much? Well, there is. Uh, look, look, in gen uh, as a general proposition, uh, if you're if you're using some nose dog, you know, a turd dog, no, not a turd dog, a scat dog uh, at night, you know, it, it's going to be fairly limited value. You're not going to be staggering around behind the dog in the dark trying to find cat scats or fox scats and things like that. But at night. We use the dogs. Our dogs are actually in there. If they get a whiff of something as, as we're driving along in, a, in an ATV or in, or in one of the vehicles, uh, they'll, they'll indicate straight away that there's something there. We'll be able to turn on the night vision gear and find find the thing fairly quickly. So your ability to read the dog, the dogs will pick, pick things up much, much quicker than we will. If you're just relying on your eyes, um, you're at a significant disadvantage. So dogs at night are great, especially when it comes to recovery of of uh, shot or trapped animals. But, yeah, especially, you know, it's say trap, trap dogs. If you're looking for a dog, a dog's the best thing to use to find a dog. Same, Thanks. same applies to foxes, etc. Makes sense. Um, Fiona had a question as well. Shoot, Fiona. Yeah, I was just wondering, hey, this is really interesting. And I was, I was just wondering, what, what do you consider as one of the most difficult species out there to, to locate, to find? And then I guess maybe the same question of is there is there a specific species where you think the dogs holds most value to you in being able to to find those those animals? Well, look, look we're a we're a yeah, we're a commercial company. We're, you know, we're 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 in business to make dough, and at the same time we're going to be very good at what we do. So, um, as as nice as it would be to have a dog concentrating on say species like ready and sliders. Um, which are you know turtles that are obvious that are that are illegally brought into Australia. Um, there's not that much call for that sort of work, even though we've, we've, we've got dogs that'll do the work. It's just that there's a lot of as you as you know there's a lot of mucking around to to, to uh, get a dog to um, consistently um, identify that odour, in particular in the context where we where we operate. So most the vast majority of the dogs that we use we use for uh, for cat work, foxes, wild dogs, rabbits, rodents, and ungulates, you know, deer and things like that. Uh, that that's where we get most of the work because um, we, that's that's where best return is for us. Um, mm. We've you know the dogs have um, you know, as, as you all know, um, you can you can train them to identify or to indicate on any odor, but um, the more you know, the, the more work that's involved, or the, you know, the more work that's available, especially with regards to stuff like cats, um, the, the more attractive it is to us, you know. Does that make any sense? Yeah. To you? Hello? Yeah, yeah that, that did. That's, uh, yeah, I was also just wondering, are, are your dogs then, just from, from listening to you, they do both kind of air sensing or, or like looking for evidence of the animals? And then they're also like tracking dogs as well. Is that right? You get like a few different kind of we're, disciplines we're, 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 that's in one dog. We're fortunate enough to have quite a few dogs. Um, some dogs have got that, that are fantastic with the ability to be able to pick things up air sensing um, and, and, and using the available sense. Some dogs are very cold nose, which means you know they're, they're capable of picking up a scent that's significantly older than other. Other dogs don't even indicate; they don't even show. You know, so if we're looking, if, if we're looking for something that's been there, say, forty-eight hours ago, uh, many dogs wouldn't even smell it, or, the, or, or the, if they did smell it, they wouldn't get excited about it. We're, we've got other dogs that are very cold nose, and they're good for being able to pick up stuff that that hasn't been in the area for a while, or that's moved through, um, you know, a longer time previously. But uh, the dog, the, the way that dogs. Um, Pick up scent varies. Some, some, you know, they'll, they'll pick it up in any way that it's available. You know, be it on in the air, uh, on on the ground, uh, on on plants, on wherever the wherever the animals have moved through. The dogs will pick the scent up. And the dogs that have demonstrated their best ability or the, the, the highest hit rate are the ones that um, that we use. Uh, not not every single dog that uh, enters the program uh, graduates. You know. The, there's a few that have to get sacked along the way, and uh, we identify with we identify their strengths and weaknesses, and uh, and exploit you know their, their strengths. 
but you could have, you know, you could have five or six yeah. pubs out of the sun glitter. Some will be, some will be absolute, you know, champions. Others will be sort of casual sort of dudes that don't really want to work too hard, you know. So we sort of aim at, we aim at breeding, the, um, you know, the, from the ones that demonstrate those uh, those traits that we that we're looking for. Um, I think Dave had a question as well. If you're happy with that, Fee. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yep. Lisa, um, Dave Pasolinic here. Look, I just want to go back to working dogs at night and if you could just provide some examples of that, how you work them at night. Um, you did mention about having him in the back of an ATV and that, and I'm just curious about um, how, how the different types of animals and how you work them. We use side-by-side ATVs, you there? Yep, go, Alex. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't use bikes anymore because we can't, we can't get insurance for them. So we use side by side things like um, Kubotas and Rangers, and the dogs in with a handler. And it's it, it, you know oftentimes you'll be move, you'll be moving through areas where it doesn't look like there's anything around, especially in say you know snow gum woodland or forest where um, you're using uh, say artificial light or night vision gear or thermal imagery uh, doesn't really work particularly well. Um, the dogs will be able to pick things up and indicate that there's something there. That we would never have known was there without the dog being, you know, in the vehicle. And so, what does the dog do then, Alex? Does it jump out of the vehicle when it detects? No, no, something? no. We don't. We don't. They don't jump out of the vehicle. They'll, they'll just be cut. Some, some, of, some of them will bark. Some will start to whine. Some will start to scratch. <coughs> scratch at the seat. Pardon me. <coughs> that um, indicating that there's something there. So yeah, the hand, the handler's ability to be able to read the dog is yeah. usually. Um, it's usually fairly important. No, don't worry, I've got plenty that want to jump out and, and, and get involved fairly quickly. But, uh, we try to keep that down to a minimum if you can. The safety of the dog and, and of the handlers, especially you're talking some fairly rough terrain, some of these areas we're operating in, both in, both in Alpine regions and in, in uh, you know, other, other areas. So then you stop and let the dog get out and actually go and indicate? Well, no, well, the, the dog's, dog's actually indicating. Generally, out of a vehicle, they're picking scent up that's airborne scent, usually on the wind. Yeah. And it, it'll give us an indication as to where we can where we can use the, the other uh, um, location systems, you know, like the NDDs or the thermal imagery gear or the artificial light gear mm -hmm. to identify where, where the critter is that the dog's indicating, you know. And many times you'll, the, the dogs will indicate You'll you'll uh, you'll fire up the the pulsar and, and you'll you'll see the critter you know within a fairly short distance of um, of where the dogs indicate, which is a bonus. They, you know, all all of these this being technology here um, has got operates on batteries and has got battery life. You know, if you're operating at twenty four seven, invariably you've got to keep recharging batteries, wasting a lot of time and effort. When you've got a dog, um, it cuts down on a lot of that sort of stuff. Yeah, so Alex, when you're uh, looking at the different species, what sort of species have you used for dogs at night to indicate? Um, is, does it vary across the board or is it particular ones that are better than others? Yeah, the, the context of this, of this presentation really is predatory species, things like foxes, cats and dogs. And uh, in our experience, they are, they're most active sort of after dark or you know, early in the morning or, or early evening. And um, we, we found that, that the, using the dogs as part of um, as part of the fire team is uh, is invaluable. It also, it's also pretty good when you when we're uh, say a dog's taking a drag off somewhere after dark. You can find you can you can find them much easier than relying on your eyes to find the you know find the marks of the drag. Yeah, thanks for that, Alex. That's great. No worries. Um, it's, it's, this, isn't, this is much harder We're having a PowerPoint presentation and not being able to, to refer to photographs and stuff here. Um, I'm just trying to work out a way of... I can assure yeah. you there's a lot of people listening. Um, yeah, I don't make a knucklehead out of myself here either. There's, 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 sort of, there's sort of 70 slides, 70 slides here. Um, it's, just, it's a shame that you can't see them. You don't, you're not... You're not making a knucklehead out of yourself at all, Alex. Thank you very much. I know it's hard when you've got technical problems. Yeah, yeah I'm finding it very I'm, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer it in regards to the training of the dogs and, and the types of dogs that we use. Um, 
at the risk at, at the risk of sounding, I suppose, a bit arrogant when it comes to the dogs. You know, they, some people seem to have in their in their mind's eye that only certain breeds can do certain things. Where uh, that's not always the case. And, uh, we rely very much on um, on dogs that are the the sort of I suppose uh, function specific as far as breeding is concerned, and we exploit we exploit that that exhibited behaviour. Uh, a lot, as as a lot of other operational dog people do as well. You know, um, we, we use yard terriers or German hunting terriers quite a lot, and German wirehead pointers as well. And um, you know, a couple of the guys have got those uh, rotten spring spaniels and sort of <laughs> my things. But um, <laughs> we the, the the management of predators, especially with the breeds that I've specified, it seems we seem, seem to do extremely well. Um, even with say rabbits in areas, say in the, in the context of a say cemeteries, rabbits cause significant damage in cemeteries where they're undermining graves and monuments. Um, and to, to go through um, something like a cemetery where, where you can't use acute poisons and, and where shooting is not appropriate, uh, dogs identifying rabbits in monuments is fantastic. It's a very quick way of doing things, and the terriers seem to work very well. And we, we couple those with using, I know it's fairly laborious, but uh, we couple those with using ferrets as well and uh, bowling the rabbits out from under the monuments. And that uh, works extremely well and it's an extremely efficient way of dealing with it. Um, but also with with, uh, with cats, um, they spent to, um, the, the hounds are good with cats, but the, the terriers, because of their fairly small size, um, and they're fairly fit and robust little fellas, uh, you can you can use them for for generally for longer periods of time than you would other breeds, and you don't have to turn them over as much. We're highly sensitive to to dogs um, you know, getting tired during work, and you know, and their dogs' welfare during um, during operations. So we don't we don't stick them out there for hours on end. You know, the the handlers are all trained to, to keep an eye on the dog and identify um, any fatigue issues, and then we do a dog swap. So, you know, all our handlers usually run two or three dogs. A couple of guys have got four. And uh, that, that seems to be an effective way of doing things without unnecessarily, um, you know, jeopardising the dog's welfare. So you're saying those little terriers can go for longer than those bigger dogs? They, they run rings around them. <laughs> Absolutely run rings around them. They're, they're like the little ever ready battery man. You know, they just go for it. They're fantastic. They're they're, uh, they're very um, they're very very athletic. They've got an extremely high prey drive, and um, they're desperate to work. They just love. They've got a fantastic work ethic compared to um, some of the other breeds. You know, you know, as far as keeping interest is concerned, they're fantastic for that sort of stuff. And you know, these dogs are, yeah, you know, some of them are. You know, three or five or six kilos ringing wet. They're only tiny little dogs. And the good thing about them too is um, they can get into areas where a lot of the larger dogs have, have difficulty getting through, especially in, you know, under blackberries and things like that where, you know, a lot of dogs will balk at, you know, bashing through blackberries where those little terriers go through like a little needle. They're fantastic. Is that mostly borders that you're using or no, a bunch of different... Mouth. <laughs> no. Okay, no, sorry. German, German hunting terriers. Or oh, yeah, that's J-A- right. J A G D terriers. Yep. Little, little black and tan terriers. Yep. But, uh, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have border terriers, but uh, I, I do know guys that have border terriers that do similar work. And uh, look, they're great little dogs, but unfortunately, for at the risk of sounding like a bastard, um, unfortunately for borders, um, They've fallen into the hands of those that like to see them perform in a show ring and not so much in an operational context. And um, the work ethic has suffered as a result of that. Yeah. I know it's something they use in New Zealand a lot with their rodent programs, so. Well, we're trying, we're trying very hard. We've already got a few young terriers over in New Zealand, but we're trying very hard to, um, to demonstrate to the to the Kiwis that uh, there's not a border terrier on earth that will outsniff a yard terrier. <laughs> I'm sure we could argue about breed all day. Um, 
There's well, about five or six I'm minutes. Really about dog people. If you, ever, if you ever lost in the bush and you're on your own, uh, start talking about dog training and somebody will come along and find you about you and toss you. The only thing that dog trainers can agree on, isn't it, that they disagree? Um, oh, that's exactly right. It, it is, it's quite funny when you listen to some of these guys, you know. But, and, 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 you know, it's very easy to, to start a to start a fight just by, you know, throwing a little few little things in there. Um, I think with, talking to people about, you know, you can only use positive reinforcement to train dogs, you know. And, uh, people swear black and blue, that's the only way to train a dog. All right, we've got another question from the floor, Alex. Yeah, um, Naomi? Yes, I am. Hi, Alex. Thank you. How are you? Um, this has been great. Oh, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's really good to hear about how um, you're applying everything that you're doing. Um, I'm curious with the Jag Terriers, you mentioned that they've got a high prey drive. So when you're working them, are you managing that for the goal of whatever species you're looking for or how does it work? Well, the thing is, you, without, at the risk of... You know, going giving you a lesson on, on dog training. Everybody's got different ways of doing things. Um, for a dog with high prey drive, um, identifying which drive the dog's in is the best way to get the best out of the dog. So if that dog desperately wants to get in there and get whatever that critter is, be it a rat, um, you know, in a wall, or be it a be it a cat in a tree, um, we, we we encourage the dog to to, to want to. To, to find that thing and uh, we encourage them in many cases to want to self-reward that's what they'll do they'll, they'll try to grab the cat or the, or the rat but or, you know i'm just using these as examples but we, we we don't let them actually close with the animal we'll let them grab the animals you know and um yeah. at, the end of the, at the end of the day we divert that and it's usually a tug toy or a, or a ball that'll that'll, that'll um, we'll give them a reward if yeah. If um, they do, we, we, if there's a danger of non-target species, we, our dogs are great as far as being able to be called off the concern. They're pretty good with that. Uh, if there's a danger where you've got non-targets there, we muzzle the dogs, provided they're on a lanyard on the lead. We, we don't muzzle dogs that are, that are free running. Uh, okay. and that, we, we factor that into a risk assessment. It muzzles, and muzzles themselves are fairly dangerous to dogs if they're yeah. in, you know, operating in heavy cover. Uh, we, we've lost dogs drowning with muscles, we've had dogs lose eyes, we've had sticks down their throats, we've had all sorts of stuff. So we we, we specify if, if, you get, if the dog's going to be on a muzzle, it'll, it'll be on a it'll be on a zipper or on a um, on a long line. Mm, okay, cool. Thank you. That helps. Awesome. I'm just going to say, Alex, because we've only got a few minutes left. Um, if there's some a few more questions from the floor. Uh, directed for Alex, particularly. Look, anybody, feel free to give us a call or send us an email if you, if you want to see how we do stuff. Um, I'm, there's not too many things that we keep secret as far as our business is concerned. Um, and we're always we're always on. Uh, I suppose we're we're perpetual students. We're always lo looking for better ways of doing things and learning more more and more about how to get the best out of the dogs and how to be more effective in what we do. Um, our main, as, as I say, our main target predators these days are cats and foxes because they're the ones that are, as everybody knows, I suppose, causing the most damage as far as um, the damage to you know, native wildlife is concerned. Um, <coughs> you know, our, our wildlife is fairly naive when it comes to avoiding predators like cats and foxes. So they're up against it and if... Uh, yeah, if we can do anything with conservation dogs to sort of try to, you know, slow that down a bit, it'll be good. Well, I think it's a huge part of what we do, Alex. Um, you know, it's all good saving the threatened species, but it's the predators that's causing them the most grief, really. Well, the thing is, often, oftentimes we've done scat analysis on on on, on predators, you know, or, or stomach content analysis, and people weren't even aware that the species that were inside the, the cat or the fox were, were in the area, you know. We we, just, we recently did PM on a cat that we got up at Mount Hotham and it, um, it had a, a broad tooth rat in it. You know, and uh, you know people are aware that the the things are up there. They don't get the steam in. You know, we've had them come up with antichinus, and, uh, even ringtail possums. You don't see a lot of ringtail possums on the top of Mount Bogong, but they are there. You know. And, it's uh, a um, interesting way to do a faunal survey through the stomach contents of cats. 
but obviously well, they're, effective. They're, they're, better at, they're better at finding fauna than we are. Because if they, if they can't find fauna, they die. We're just, uh, we're, we're learners as far as uh, yeah. being able to match predators is concerned, that's for sure. And I guess that's what we're tapping into with the dogs, using that ability they have to find them to help us. Exactly, exactly. And, and as I say, we've been at this for, for a while. We're, we're drawing expertise from, from every area where we can get it. Um, as I said, I'm lucky enough to have um, some uh, military veterans that, um, that have got good skills in these areas. And uh, we couple that with some of the things that uh, myself and a couple of the other guys that are pro hunters um, have got. And um, it, makes it, it makes for a pretty effective outfit. All right. Well, I'm conscious that it's seven and I know we had a bit of a late start, but if people haven't well, got I'm, questions I'm, for I'm, Alex. Oh, actually, I've got a question. Good. Go, okay, Mel. Hello. Sorry. I, I, no? I didn't realise I was actually on mute so i've been trying to jump in for a bit um alex do you have you done much work in victoria or well anywhere working amongst penguin colonies or around shorebirds and shearwaters to try and find cats well i was i was in dialogue with uh, some people that are actively engaged in that um, very recently um, and there's a fairly good chance that they'll be using one of our pups, trying to get pups to uh, to do exactly that. But um, yeah, we, we we haven't actually done the work uh, around penguin colonies and um, shearwater colonies at the stage with any of our dogs. But um, we're, we're always looking for the opportunity. Yeah, no worries. I've just I've just actually come from a meeting today where we were having that conversation and. Um, De Pip, uh, well, I'm from Tassie, so um, De Pip, we have been doing some work um, on Bruni Island um, with uh, GPSing cats, seeing where they go. Um, yeah. And actually, I think you want to sue Robinson's dogs to help find a cat that, that, that died somewhere and they couldn't find the GPS collar because they couldn't get the signal. So they actually used the dog to find the dead cat. Um, but yeah. Anyway, I was just sort of curious to know if there'd been much you've well, been involved in it. I love looking for dead things. As long as they've been dead for a long time, they, they find them, and then the way they indicate is usually by rolling in the dead thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably any dog could do that. <laughs> That's well, your you're trained to learn. These, these these dogs that we use, they, they don't know that they're special. So they, sometimes they just behave like good old fashioned you know, fighters from anywhere. And, you know, roll, rolling in dead things is just you know, good to do when you're a dog, eh? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, thanks, Alex. No worries. And, and I think, Alex, it's probably good to know, because you have come from that hunting background, um, which is probably not as familiar to a lot of people um, with dogs as what it would be to, obviously, some like yourself. Um, there's a different way of training the dogs and of bringing them up, where you just expect them. To well, almost it, it, do the job, look, you, it, you're focusing on that original yeah, prey drive that you were saying. It's it's not just prey drive. There's various drives that you're looking for in, in, in hunting dogs. And when you talk about hunting dogs, you're, you're talking about a broad spectrum of dogs with various different uh, skill sets and um, and abilities and and behaviours. Um, you know, ranging from you know things like terriers that, that were bred initially to you know go go under the ground and and grab foxes and badgers by the head and drag them out and kill them. That's, that was the original role, you know. Um, we can't have that happen these days. So we adapt, we, we exploit that behaviour and we adapt um, that desire to, to achieve what we're seeking to achieve. Uh, with hounds and things like that, there's nothing that's going to outsmell a hound out in the bush. We don't need to teach that hound to go and find things. He wants to do that naturally. We just uh, adapt it to suit the purposes that we're, you know, the way, what our goals are. Um, with a wide head point of view, you know, they're versatile hunting, what they call versatile hunting dogs, which means they're, they're probably a jack of all trades and a, and a master of none, but they're damn good <laughs> nose dogs. They're easy to manage. Um, they've got excellent drive uh, and they're very easy to train. Uh, the terriers um, need a higher level of expertise as far as training is concerned. To, to ensure that you're not um, 
you know, causing more damage than uh, than good. But you know, with with the hounds, with the hounds that we use, especially for uh, overabundant uh, animals like deer, um, they're they're invaluable for for getting them out of areas where they're causing damage. You know, and uh, we're we're constantly working on on exploiting those those behaviours. I know it's it's nice for people to think, oh, we went down to the dog pound and we rescued a dog and we turned him into a nose dog and it was all great, you know, and and you know, more more power to their arms. But as pros, you need to be able to consistently come up with dogs that are going to do this work and reproduce um, that level of performance. And it's not it's not that easy to do with um, with with rescue dogs. You, you have to go through quite a few dogs to get to get a result. Or you'll get it, get the desired result. You know, so yeah, um, yeah, it's fair enough. Hopefully, that made some sense. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to throw it out for last questions. If there's anyone else, um, doesn't look like it. Uh, I'm going to offer to babysit Alex. I have a black cat that sneaks into my yard and eats my dog food every night, and my cat, my dog, is just not interested. It's happy to share. <laughs> Rule, rule one is never leave any dog food out. <laughs> if you live in a suburban area. Yeah. Your dog won't starve to death if you feed him once a day. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It's just not much of an animal. <laughs> um. But if you can condition the cat into eating dog food, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to track. Uh, I just want to check um, Gillian's unmuted. Did you have a question for Alex? No, no. I'm just listening and, um, yeah, I just wanted to be unmuted to, to thank everybody for, for this and thank Alex. It was a great comments and um, information. I, I, I apologise for, um, for this, this uh, IT failure. Hopefully um, I'll, I'll email this, um, uh, uh, this PowerPoint presentation to Emma and she hopefully will make it available to all of you. And if you have any further questions, feel free to, you know, email me, send a smoke signal, ring up, whatever you want. I'm happy to talk to you. As long as you don't mind me ringing or emailing you, asking you questions about how you do things. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thanks, Alex. That was excellent. Really yeah. great. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Appreciate it. That was good. And we'll get that up in the next um, few days. We'll get that. PowerPoint up and I'll link on Facebook for people to find. Thanks, Alex. Okay, thanks, folks. Thanks, Bye. Alex. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Thanks, Alex.